how would you define yourself as a leader? Well, I think at the core of leadership is helping people achieve big things, bigger things than they might be able to achieve alone, uh, to realize grand ambitions and to make the world a better place. And I think those are the things that animate uh, the issues and the activities that I try to lend my leadership to. And underneath that, I think it's important to think about uh, not just leadership, but followership. I think there's been an incredible focus on leadership over the last 20 years or so, and perhaps too little conversation about what it makes to be a good follower, because many of us, depending on the organizations or the um, institutions that we're involved in, uh, we're called upon not just to lead, but also to follow too. And I think there needs to be a much deeper meditation on what it means to be a great follower as much as it does uh, to be to be a great leader. Did you feel that you had a solid plan for your success? Well, my success such as it is, is a reflection of a set of interests and a set of questions that I wanted to pursue more than success per se. Uh, I had a transformational economics teacher in high school at Pearson College on Vancouver Island. And at the time, I thought I would likely be a constitutional lawyer because I wanted to work on foundational issues that affect people's lives in both a specific and a broad kind of way. Mm -hmm. And constitutional law seemed like a great opportunity to do that, uh, particularly after the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution in the early 1980s and the articulation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which continues to have such a big impact on Canadian life and has been emulated by many other countries around the world. Um, but my last two years of high school from 88 to 90, uh, this teacher made a compelling case that economics was in its ascendancy and that uh, many discussions would come down to a question of numbers rather than a question of rhetoric and that if one is able to think about big ideas and think about the math around them as well, uh, one might be in an incredible position to affect change. And so uh, with that uh, context, I ended up going into economics and I've been really grateful uh, for that decision. Did you find that you faced a challenging obstacle in your career that fundamentally changed the way that you lead? I don't think an obstacle has changed the way that I lead, but I think experience has. Uh, over time, I think it's become clearer and clearer how hard it is to do many things, how hard it is to sustain real progress over time, and how everything takes longer uh, than you expect it to. And that, uh, as Prime Minister McMillan, I believe, in the United Kingdom once said, that events tend to intervene. Um, and so one needs to be nimble, one needs to be uh, full of expectation that things aren't going to go as planned uh, and be able to adjust to them. So I think you know, a, a sense that uh, things, things don't always go to plan needs to be part of the plan. Now, what motivates you as a leader? Well, I think there are two things. One, as I pointed to some big ideas about how the world could be a better place, how we can make uh, economic systems and societies work more effectively, equitably, and meaningfully for more people in a more sustainable and greener way at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, how we can do so in a way that in our work together, uh, people are able to realize the ambitions they have for themselves at the same time. And I think those are the two things that animate my work as a leader. In terms of you know, the big issues that continue to interest me, they fall on two ends of a temporal spectrum, but both within the financial and economic space. One uh, on the very long run end is you know, trying to figure out what allows uh, some economies and societies to develop more quickly and over a longer period of time and achieve greater well being for people within them than others. Um, a Nobel Prize winner in economics once said that, you know, if you looked at Korea versus India or Egypt, for instance, and in the 1950s following the Korean War, 
uh, both India and Egypt were substantially richer than what has become known as South Korea today. At the end of the mm -hmm. Korean War, uh, North Korea would probably have been the one of the two Koreas that most people would have bet on succeeding because they had more natural resources and more industry than the largely mm -hmm. decimated South. In fact, now uh, South Korea is 20 time, 23 times to 24 times richer per person than either India mm -hmm. or Egypt. And if one can figure out what combination of policies has led to a performance like that, the implications for human well being are potentially incredible. Uh, and so that's one of the areas uh, that I've been focused on. On the other end of the temporal spectrum is uh, short run crises in financial markets and in economies. And I've been incredibly interested in figuring out how you anticipate them, how you prevent them if you see them coming, how you mop up from them most effectively and quickly when they do occur and how you set things in place to try to prevent their recurrence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a combination of long run growth and development and very short run uh, crisis prevention, management and mitigation uh, mm -hmm. that remain the focus of, uh, of my work. Mm -hmm. Are you finding with the pandemic that you've had to adjust the way that you lead or motivate your teams? I think everyone has had to adjust almost everything mm -hmm. that they do in some way around the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fortunate at Scotiabank that uh, big investments in technology and mm -hmm. networks that enable us to work remotely were made prior to the pandemic. And so we transitioned relatively seamlessly into working remotely and from home. Mm -hmm. And I'm deeply grateful for that. Uh, at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. the work that we do often requires us to you know delve into data to sift through it to write and many of our activities are are ones that can be done equally well in the office environment we formerly worked in or from home um, and so we're fortunate on that front too uh, if anything uh, one of the things that we've had to guard against is people working too much including myself because there are bigger needs there are big questions that uh, the current moment poses to economists that we're well suited to answer and we certainly want to help. Uh, but you know, there's been a lot of discussion about a greater productivity happening during the pandemic for some white collar workers who, who are able to work remotely. I think we'll actually see productivity go down, not because uh, people are doing less work, but in fact, because people are doing more. They're working longer hours. They're breaking down distinctions between work days and time off. And mm -hmm. as a result, they're, they're getting more done. But I'm suspicious that the amount that's done per hour of work done may be going down because we're growing the number of hours that we're working so mm -hmm. much. Um, and so in terms of our leadership, uh, you know, we've been very careful to try to set boundaries around work to ensure that people are able to work flexibly as mm -hmm. well in ways that suit the other demands that exist on their time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've put into place uh, a lot more formalized and regular check-ins uh, with our colleagues. Um, and it means communicating through a real range of different channels. Uh, you know, we're on Zoom today. I've probably used eight or nine different webcast platforms uh, mm -hmm. during the course of the day as we're publishing and writing and interacting with clients. I may be on a webcast platform at the same time as I'm messaging through Teams and Skype and through SMS and emailing and putting messages onto Bloomberg Messenger. So the ways we stay in touch have become a lot more varied. And I think it also means that uh, there's a real uh, imperative on keeping uh, a presumption of the best possible intentionality when one's communicating remotely like this to ensure that you know, we're effective, uh, that we don't read into things that are not there, and uh, you know, that we avoid uh, misunderstandings that would be unfortunate. Now, one of the things for leaders is the importance of balancing the mind and their help uh, with everything else that's going on. How do you balance your time? 
Uh, well, I've been a distance athlete for a long time. I did triathlons for about 15 years. I've retreated from doing those, but during the pandemic, I've really upped my running an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, I sit on a rowing machine almost every other day as well, an ergometer, which I enjoy and you know, watch the news or right now I'm binge watching uh, past episodes of The Crown to get caught up yeah. to the current <laughs> season. Uh, it's my first binge of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much because I, I dislike TV. I watched Limitless TV as a kid and I think I kind of used up most of my lifetime hours at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, despite us talking about trying to maintain some work-life balance during mm -hmm. the pandemic, I've been working a massive amount. And so there really hasn't been any time uh, for much uh, TV viewing. But the main thing I have tried to do is ensure I come out of the uh, lockdowns at least as fit as I went into them. Um, and so running, uh, bike, uh, stationary cycle, rowing machine have all been big parts of that. Mm -hmm. That is my goal too. <laughs> if not more, at least not less, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, now, what do you think is the role of leaders or what is it that they should do different um, when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Uh, well, I think ensuring both pieces of that uh, diversity and inclusion uh, require some very specific intentionalities. On diversity, I think it requires uh, building in really different processes uh, to how we go about recruiting, building teams and sustaining them. It means you know, taking a very intentional lens to ensuring that every time you look at a room, every time that you look at a potential candidate list, every time you think about how uh, you put people together, uh, you have uh, a set of diversity lenses that you bring uh, mm -hmm. to that view and ensure that you know, you're doing the best possible to ensure that you're not building a room uh, or a team that looks like you, either uh, notionally or uh, in terms of the qualities of uh, qualities of the people who who you're bringing together. Inclusion uh, is a further choice uh, and a further intentionality. Inclusion doesn't happen just because you have diversity. Uh, inclusion means that you know the initial moment where diversity has been achieved has to be sustained through continual efforts at diversity or inclusion, I should say, where you, know, you are dedicating yourself to ensuring that uh, conversations, decision-making processes, uh, mentorship are all uh, centered around ways in which you can keep bringing that diversity to bear to the real work of a team. And so, you know, I think some ways diversity is a, a, a point in time, inclusion is something that happens over time. Now, what advice would you give younger leaders? If there was one thing that you could coach them, what would that be? Uh, you know, I think one of the most important things is to at least set a preliminary view on what are the things that interest you? What are the things that you want to do? Where are the places that you want to get to? Mm -hmm. And enlist mentors, advocates, sponsors, uh, friends uh, in that. No one can help unless they have at least some goalpost around which to orient that help. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I often uh, get inquiries from folks who want to talk about careers and uh, the possibility of working in economics in Toronto or elsewhere. And uh, it also, you know, in cases, uh, in some cases, people who want to work in other fields that are related to places where uh, I've been in the past. Uh, but it's difficult to help if there isn't a clear sense, even if it's a provisional sense mm -hmm. of where people want to get to. Uh, people don't know how to orient their assistance unless there is at least some uh, draft uh, set of goals in mind. Those can change over time, uh, mm -hmm. but to get the conversation going, at least setting a few uh, draft targets out there is really useful. Now, what would you say is your leadership credo? Well, you know, 
credo as a term has uh, a lot of possible meanings. Um, you know, some interpret it as a vision or a sense of mission. Uh, I think of it more in terms of a quality that inhabits leadership. And uh, I distill it down to one word, which is empathy, which has become a more and more um, sort of front and center concept in both social interaction and in building teams and organizations. Uh, I think it's possibly the most important one because it means leading with a memory of uh, your younger self, your less experienced self. Uh, it means uh, leading with a current sense of the people that you're interacting with and seeking to motivate and bring together toward bigger things. Mm -hmm. And it means thinking about the future and where those people are developing toward and where they're hoping to go. And so I think empathy is really a cornerstone of leadership and perhaps my credo. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to ask you, is there a book that you would recommend um, and say, Sarah, you have to read this um, to understand leadership from a different perspective? Would you have a recommendation? Uh, there's a slim volume by uh, John Kenneth Galbraith called Name Dropping, which I think is fantastic. He had been asked to write a great book on the leaders he had worked with across his storied career. And he was late in life and he's candid in the foreword to name dropping that he got partway into it and realized he wasn't terribly interested in writing the book. He didn't have any grand, um, he didn't have any grand insights on these leaders to offer beyond a few points. And so instead he strung together a set of stories about his interactions with great leaders that I think ended up being really revelatory about uh, the people they were, why they ended up or were considered great leaders and how they humanized that leadership, uh, mm -hmm. both in em empathetic terms and in just very quoted in day-to-day -day terms uh, mm -hmm. in ways that brought people along with them. So. Uh, it's a little untraditional, but I point people to it. I don't think there's a clear recipe in it, but there's lots of little tidbits people might enjoy picking up. Now, if you have an opportunity to write a book on a specific topic that you think um, you could summarize your learnings or, or write as a leader, what would you write about? Oh, well, there are a few books I have rattling around in my head that may manage to get onto paper at some point. I think at some stage, I'd love to write, uh, whether it's an essay, because I think most mm -hmm. good ideas can be contained within an essay. They don't really need an entire book. Uh, mm -hmm. Often books uh, you know, end up being padded with lots of examples or uh, sort of anecdote or stories. But you know, the key ideas that you might try to get across, if they can't be done in an essay, then maybe they need a little more rethinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know, one of the things I'm lucky to be able to do every day is write about how economic policy can be formulated to be more effective for people. And I think I'd like to build some of that into a bit of a, a, a bit of a manifesto on mm -hmm. uh, how we can make Canada uh, an even better place to live and develop than it is right now. Mm -hmm. And if I could ask you for a quote that could be your legacy as a leader, what would that quote be? Well, I don't know that there's a single quote, but I would distill, I think most of the things I work, think are worth thinking about in human interaction and leadership to variations on the golden rule that, you know, is the, the real cornerstone of empathy that, you know, we, we should do for and to others what we would wish to have done to us. And I think if we all kept that in mind, it's not just leadership, but almost every aspect of our lives would function a little better, uh, a little more kindly and a little more effectively too.